Hey, I'm Arthur. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for being here this morning, battling through the fog, because I know it's life-threatening fog out there today. So thanks for doing that. And there's, these surveys are in your seat if you're wondering what to do with them uh, or when you'll have time to do it. Now's a good time because you're like, it's okay to do something while he talks. Sure, go, go ahead. You can draw on it, do whatever. Um, but we really would love uh, for, if you would take just a, a, about a minute and a half to do that. That would be great. Uh, also, I want to just tell you, I, I mean, I know most of you know this, but I'm new here. <laughs> but there has been so much work that has been done prior to m- me getting here uh, by the vision team and the finance team and the staff here at Southcrest. I mean, they have done a remarkable job in taking care of people, encouraging people, loving on people. Uh, and I'm just, uh, you know, just, just been amazed at, at what they have done and so thankful to them for uh, all that they have done to make sure that uh, God was still being honored here and what was said and what was done. And so c- could we just give those guys a round of applause this morning? Can we do that? Uh, they have just been just amazing people, and uh, I, I just, I, I love, uh, love being here. I love you guys, and um, I just want a couple other things real quick, and then actually we'll start teaching here in just a second, but uh, there are a lot of people who are in, still recovering from Hurricane Florence, uh, and so it's, in, I mean, it's not going to take them a couple weeks. It's going to take them a couple years, uh, but we are looking at a couple of different possibilities, how we can get there and how we can... Uh, For people who would like to go there and do some work to help some of the people that are there, Uh, we're looking at one or two trips uh, relatively soon, we hope, Uh, and we're uh, working with a couple partner churches there that we can do some stuff with. In the meantime, uh, I've got a good friend who's there, and he was telling me the other day that, you know, that, that just simple things, that there's, you know, McDonald's is not open, and I mean, just, there's just nothing there right now. It's very, just a mess. But one way that, uh, that we can help people, if you would like to, to help people, is we're going to collect uh, gift cards from Home Depot, from Lowe's, and from Walmart. Uh, because the people who, uh, who need something, uh, they need to be able to get and do some just little repairs. And so we've got a church we're partnering with there that will distribute to people who are uh, particularly in need. And so if you want to bring those for the next couple of weeks, uh, cards from Home Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart, and we'll do our very best to get them there as quickly as possible. And we've got a good church that we can partner with there uh, as we're continuing to, to work through all that. And um, next week, I'm starting a new series. So just a quick heads up to you. Uh, next week, the new series is called Worship Changes Everything. And here's what you need to know. Uh, we're going to flip the order of service here for the next four weeks. So uh, and here's what I mean, is that we'll probably do one song and then someone will be teaching and then we'll do three or four more songs at the end of the service. So why am I telling you that? I'm just saying if you usually get here like 10 or 15 minutes late, you're going to miss the first five or 10 minutes of the message. And you're going, yes, I knew I loved this church. That is so good. Uh, so anyway, just a heads up on that. But we're really excited about this new series as, uh, as we're going to really focus in on uh, on worship. And I think you'll find that most people have never heard a series on worship. And so uh, we're really excited about it and believe God's going to use that to really uh, unite us and encourage us in the days ahead. Um, have you ever noticed that sometimes people just don't get it? Have you ever seen somebody like that who just, you know, like, what are you saying? What are you doing? Or you read a sign somewhere and you see that sign and so say, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I, I have a few of those this morning to show you real quick. Uh, this first sign, I, I guess, is probably left over from spring break. Um, please beware the balcony is not on ground level. Uh, see, you know why? Because somebody said, I think I can just step off this balcony. Uh, probably what happened there. Uh, this next one is kind of interesting. It says, anyone caught exiting through this door will be asked to leave. <laughs> you ever heard that expression, not the sharpest knife in the drawer? You ever heard that one? Uh, and then this, this next one's kind of interesting. This is just confusing. Uh, I, re- I really don't know what that means, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you see something like that and you see, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, you know people just, just don't get it, you know? Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I flew from Atlanta to Allentown, Pennsylvania, 
And so I get on the airplane. It's not the flight attendant's fault. I know that the government tells them they have to say these things, but I just I still think it's kind of you know ridiculous that you know they said uh, they show you how to put your seatbelt on in case you haven't been in a car since 1957. This is how a seatbelt works. It goes together like this, and then you and it releases. That's good. Uh, they said in the event of a water landing, your seat can be used as a flotation device. And I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm flying from Atlanta to Allentown. If we have a water landing, we have bigger problems. Uh, that, that's really not a, a good thing, right? I, I, was at a, uh, I was at a hotel not too long ago. I was on the 31st floor. And sometimes I get bored when I get to the hotel. So I'm kind of walking around looking. And this is an older hotel. And so I'm look at the back of the door. It says, what to do in the event of a fire? And it says, in, in, in event of fire, number one, wet the sheets. <laughs> See, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I wake up, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, my room is on fire, wetting the sheets is not going to be a problem. <laughs> Number two, call the front desk. Hello, front desk, this is room 3106. I've wet the sheets and my room is on fire. <laughs> How does that help anybody? Right? And, and then number three, it says, move toward the window and await further assistance. I'm on the 31st floor. There is not a ladder truck in the world that reaches 31 floors. What I'm supposed to do is just wake some angel kind of wake up and say, hey, I'm going to carry you out of here. It just, it makes, it just makes no sense, right? Um, the, the, the other day, I'm with um, my daughter Hannah, and we're at her favorite French department store, Target. And so we're making a return, right? And there's somebody in front of us, and they have got an incredible amount of diapers right in front of me. And I look, notice on one of the sides of one of those bags of diapers, it says, holds up to 27 pounds. I love babies. I, I, I had three of them. You know, just about every Sunday morning, I go by and say hey to all the preschoolers uh, and all that. But I'm telling you, if a little kid walks up to me with 27 pounds worth of diaper, I'm just not so sure about that, right? Uh, so uh, anyway, you, you see things all the time that you just don't get. I said, you know. I'm one of those people, sometimes I get confused. Sometimes Laura has to tell me something three or four times before I understand it. Uh, you know, I, I, I get it. But, you know, one of the things that we get confused about is that we have this idea, and it's our idea. It's not God's idea, but we have this idea that there are multiple ways to get to heaven. And we think it can't just be one way. I mean, there's got to be another way. And, and, and you know, and if you... If you're kind of skeptical about God, and by the way, if you're kind of skeptical about God, I'm really glad that you're here, especially today. Because, uh, you know, I, I used to be real skeptical about God too. But, you know, but here's the thing. You sit there and go, well, there's got to be another way. I mean, it's kind of intolerant, isn't it? I mean, you know, it can't just be one way that we get to heaven. That, that can't be true. Uh, that, that can't be the way that it works. And, uh, you know, so we have this idea that, there's got to be another way. And, and the premise or, or the idea that supports this idea that m there's multiple ways to get to heaven is this idea that good people get to go to heaven. See, that, that, that's where that comes from. That there's got to be another way. Be, here it is. It, there's got to be something I can do to get to heaven. It, it, it can't just be God. It, it's it's got to be I, I, I got to do something. See, it, and, and it's not even that we think that there's some group of people that they get to go to heaven because this is the common denominator between Buddhists and between uh, Christians and, uh, and between other religions is this, this idea of we sit there and go, well, it's, it's not that what they know, it's not what they don't know, it's not what we believe, it's not how we believe, it's not how we pray, but there's this idea that kind of undergirds this whole idea of multiple ways to get to heaven is this, we sit there and we think there's got to be how they behave and what they do. That, that has to be what drives it. It's, it, it, it's, we think it's about being good and about good people. And you know, a lot of Christ followers, we think the same thing. And you know, and, and we say, well, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm all right. I'm a good dad. I'm a great employee. I'm a good boss. You know, I'm a, I'm a good neighbor. I, I help people out. I, I, I take care of people. I let people in front of me in traffic. I'm, I'm a nice person. And we, we sort of believe the same thing. And see, the thing is, is there's something appealing about believing that there's another way to get to heaven and, and that 
good people go to heaven. There's something appealing about that. Did you know that 87% of people in America believe that heaven exists? 85% of people believe they're going to go there. And see, the, the, the truth is, is that most people don't believe God will do what he has said he has done. We don't believe it. Christ followers and people who are not Christ followers, they don't believe that what God has said he is, is going to do, he has already done. See, we want a backup plan. What if it's not right? What, what, if, what, what if I've been lied to? I need a backup plan. So let's talk about, I mean, because, I mean, there's, it's appealing, isn't it, to say, look, there's things that I could do to ensure that I get there. I mean, that, I get that makes sense, right? So let's talk about some reasons why good people would go, would go to heaven. I mean, that, it, it makes a little bit of sense. Number one, it's a fair system, right? It's a fair system. We go, well, look, that was only fair. Look, if I'm a good person, then, then yeah, I, I would get to go. Now, the, the truth is that fairness ended in the Garden of Eden because God said, look, just don't eat this fruit. But the fruit got eaten. And at that point, you know what would have been fair? To destroy Adam and Eve, to destroy mankind. That would have been fair. Look, just one thing. That would have been fair. And, but, but we think, well, well this, this is good. It's a fair system, though, because you know what? I, if, if I do things the right way at the right time with the right kind of expression on my face, then everything will be good. This is, I mean, there's something appealing about that, right? The, the second thing I think uh, why we think that good people might go to heaven, we say, well, you know what? I'm not perfect. And, everybody, and your wife goes, no, you're not. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm not perfect but I'm better than he is. I'm better than she is. I'm better than that whole group of people over there because that's what we do, don't we? We compare ourselves to each other. And we go, well, looking at him, looking at her, looking at them, I may not be great, but I'm better than they are, so I, I think I'll make the cut. I should get in. Uh, the third thing is, is, is it motivates you to be good, right? It, it just, it, it motivates you to be good. It's like, listen, if I, it's, it's sort of a way that we can control one another, we can manipulate one another. Look, if you'll be good, God will love you, and you'll get to go to heaven. It's Santa Claus theology. It's, if you'll be good, if you'll be good, Santa will do something really nice for you this year. Doesn't work that way. But the fourth thing is, is it's consistent with this idea of a good God, isn't it? I mean, if God is good and kind and loving, surely he would look at me and go, yeah, you're pretty good. Come on. I mean, surely he would, he would be that way. But th there are some problems with this idea that good people get to heaven. So let me share three of them with you. Three problems with this, with this whole uh, mentality of thinking that it's good people that get to go to heaven. Uh, number one, the, the, the first problem is you say, well, what's the standard? Okay, if, if good people get to go to heaven, uh, what, what's the standard? I mean, what... what what, what hurdle we have to get over? You know, it's, uh, you know, because you look at the Bible and you say, well, I'll I, I tell you what, I'll do what the Bible says. You know, and I'll be, um, uh, and the Bible says to love your neighbors yourself, to serve one another, to love one another, to encourage one another. It says to be generous and kind. And, you know, it said, go, I, I, I'll try and I, I'll do all that and I'll do it really, really good. Well, maybe so, but um, you'll never be good enough to do that the way the Bible says to do it. You know, there are, uh, there's 10, everybody knows there's 10 commandments, but you know, there's also an additional 637 laws of Moses. You uh, said, so, well, why, am I supposed to do those? Am I not supposed to do those? I mean, does that apply to me or not? Uh, what's, what's the standard? I mean, wh wh where do we find out that we're, doing it the right way, this life that we're living, right? Well, you know, the Bible itself says in Romans 3, 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory. And that word all in the Greek means all, everybody, every single person. 
What's sin? Breaking the law. Whose law? God's law. Every single person is messed up. And, and then in Romans 3.10, it says, none is righteous, no, not one. The, the Bible says there are no good people. He said, but look, I'm, I'm good. But the Bible says, mm, that no, not really. And in Romans 3.20, it says, for by works of the law, now, and that's doing the Ten Commandments. That's doing the 637 laws of Moses, right? For by works of the law, no human being will be justified, made right, pronounced innocent in his sight. It's not by what you do. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The, the law is not for us to live by. It's to re- show us how we have fallen short. See, and you're like, but, 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 but Arthur, you know, I, I, I do pretty good doing 10 commandments. I get like seven out of 10. You know, I haven't lied since like, I don't know, 945. But I, I'm, I'm never good. I didn't kill anybody this week. I don't think. But I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, it says keep the Sabbath holy. Hey, man, I'm here. It's church. I'm, I'm here. What do you want? But see, the thing is, there is no relationship in the Bible between following the law and heaven. None. I mean, there's not an 11th commandment that says if you keep 7 out of 10 of the preceding commandments, then you go to heaven. It's not there. You know, and so so we we don't have, we have no idea what's good. And, And we don't have no idea what the standard is because it's always moving. It's always shifting. It's always changing. Look, wars have been fought trying to define what is good. Um, When you were younger, there were things that, when you were younger, things that were right, and now they're wrong. There are things that when you were younger that were wrong, and now they're right. So Arthur, what are you talking about? I can give you all kinds of examples. I mean, there are so many things that we have thought, hey, this is a good thing. This is how we should live. This is what we should do. And then we realize later on, no, that was really, really wrong. And so you can't have this standard. You don't know what a standard is because it's, it's moving and shifting. You know, for a couple hundred years, there was this understanding among white church people that black people should be treated as property. That was wrong. But in the name of God, people are saying this is right. There are still over 27 million people in slavery in this world. And now we all go, yeah, that's wrong, that's wrong. But there was a time when people said it was right. And that just happened there. Listen, it happened in Germany. The the Nazis came along and said, you know what? The Jewish people, they should be destroyed. And everybody said, who was part of these Nazis, said, yeah, that's right. And it was wrong. You know, you you can talk about Native Americans in this country. That people came along and said, you know what? We We don't care about you. We want your property. We want you where you are. And we're going to annihilate you in the name of God. Listen, I I have a lot of good friends in Africa. Did you know that in Africa that people are angry at one another? Because much of Africa is still very tribal. And you would never know it if you were there. Because they live in apartments and they live in nice homes and they drive cars and they uh, dress in Western style of dress. And you think these people aren't angry at one another. But no, it's... I'm in my tribe, and you're not in my tribe. And so you know what? If you say the wrong thing to me, I will kill you. It's wrong. And so if you sit there and say, listen, it's about being good, that just, that just doesn't make any sense. See, somebody should tell us if it's being good enough. Somebody should tell us what that good enough is. I mean, see, here's the deal. We, we, we have no idea what's good. 
if, um, if you're one of these people who would say, well, Christianity is not fair because what about the guy who lives at the top of the mountain and nobody ever goes to tell him about how to come to know Jesus? And you say, it's just not fair. Uh, well, I, I would ask you the same question because if you believe that good people go to heaven, I would say uh, you've got the same kind of problem that you're accusing us of having because I've got to say to you, where's your God? If he loves you, why doesn't he tell you that it's about being good? And why does he tell you you have to do these 17 things to be good enough? Why, why does he do that? The, the, the second thing I think is a real problem with this is, is how good does the standard need to be? How good does the standard need to be? Listen, when, in school it's 70%. That's good enough. You pass. Is that good enough for God? Is it, you know, is it 52%, just a little bit better than being bad? You're just barely over the line? Look, this is, this is like saying that you go to school and when you get to school and you, uh, you walk into chemistry class and the teacher says, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you an exam in two weeks. And although we've got a whole year of school here, the, the exam I give you in two weeks, that will determine your entire grade for the course. And you say, well, I got a question. What's going to be on the test? And the teacher says, I'm not telling you. Just show up here in two weeks. So that is, you would never get in a situation like that. You would never go to work for an employer who says, I'll pay you at the end of the month. You say, well, great. Well, what are my responsibilities? What's my role here? He says, I'm not going to tell you. He says, but, but if you don't do it right, I'm going to fire you. You would never take that opportunity. See, we, we, we can't, we, we don't know what the, st- what, how good is good enough. We, we can't figure that out. It's like running a race. And you don't know where the finish line is. You just keep running and running and running and running. It, just, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It, it's, it's not a way that we can try and live. See, the problem is, is that good is a relative term. What I think is good, you may not think is good. And you're sitting there and you're trying to interpret the mind of God or you're trying to play God and say, well, I'll tell you what's good and what's good enough. Look, good is a relative term. Look, you may think that Brussels sprouts are delicious. You're wrong. I don't care what you do to them. I mean, you make little X in the bottom. You can saute them in lemon juice. Look, listen, bacon makes everything better. Everything. It's my favorite vegetable. But look, even if you wrap Brussels sprouts in bacon, they're gross. They're gross. That's a way to ruin a piece of bacon. Look, I, I'm, look, I am convinced. I'm absolutely convinced that when uh, that when people get to hell, that the first thing that they get handed is a giant bowl of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Day two, boiled cabbage. Day three, pickled beets. It's gross. But you may think that stuff is delicious, right? I think I'm a pretty good basketball player. But I go try and post up on LeBron James and try and score against him. I'm not so good. Right? Good is a relative term, and you're trying to define something relatively when you don't even know the relativity that it should be defined by. Number three, it makes a liar out of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not teach good people go to heaven. He told the religious people, those who were obsessed, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, the Levites, the, the, those who were just absolutely wrapped up and trying to follow the law and being good people. He said, no, you're not doing it. It's not about religion. It's not about a ritual. Jesus taught that bad people go to heaven. He says, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you do it with. It doesn't matter when it happened. He says, look, I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you have been. He says, you can still go to heaven. See, because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. You know, I've had a few of those conversations where I go in and I talk with someone and the doctor has told them, look, today is going to be your day. You're going to, you've got a few more hours. You know, and just honestly, that's when the family calls me and says, hey, Arthur, can you come by and talk to Dad? I say, yeah, I'll go. 
and I go to their home or I go to hospice or I go to hospital, I close the door and I just have a conversation, just me and him. And I say, you know what, it's not too late. I know you've been mad at God your whole life, but it's not too late. You know, you can put your faith in Christ right now. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, that person tells me, I just don't think so, Arthur. You don't know what I've done. I say, it doesn't matter. Arthur, I've been mean to my kids. My wife left me. You don't understand. Well, no, I don't understand why you did that, but I do understand that it doesn't matter what you've done, that God can forgive you because God loves bad people. And it doesn't matter whether you've done one thing that's wrong or a million things that's wrong. He says, look, I love you, and I want to have a relationship with you. And the guy will say, well, it's too late. No, let me show you this. So Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32, it says two others who were criminals. Now that word, sometimes it's translated thief, sometimes it's, it's translated criminals. I think more accurately, it could be translated pirate, meaning somebody who had never done a single good thing their whole life. See, in the Roman Empire, they almost never executed anyone. That was when they'd done everything else to try and make a better person out of that person or to punish them, then they would execute them. Because the Roman economy was a slave-driven economy. 80% of the people who lived in the Roman Empire were slaves. And so if you broke the law, you stole from somebody, you said something you shouldn't have said, whatever you did, they would most likely make you a slave because they didn't want to kill you because that was like throwing money away because it was a slave-driven economy. So only the worst of the worst of the worst were ever executed. And so it says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. Now, so these guys were the worst of the worst of the worst. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, help them do better. Help them to live a good life. Help them be kind to other people. Help them to be good at the Rotary Club on Thursday. No, he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And, and they cast lots, lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. So the people are starting to mock Jesus. And, and then it says, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There's also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. And then all these other people are mocking Jesus. And then there's two criminals, Jesus in the middle, criminal on each side. One of them says, are you not the Christ Save yourself and us. So he starts mocking Jesus too. But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? He said, he said, Look, dude, do you not see what's going on here? You've done things. He's offering you forgiveness. Come on. He says, he says, and we indeed justly, in other words, look, there's nothing unfair that's going on here. This is completely just. We are getting what we deserve. We did things we shouldn't have done. We are being crucified. He says, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man talking about Jesus has done nothing wrong. In other words, look, I deserve to die for what I've done. You deserve to die for what I've done. Are, are you realizing it? You've got this opportunity to do something about it right now. And listen, there was no opportunity to say, hey, hey, fellas, fellas, hey, hey, hey. Um, uh, can somebody take me down off this cross because I need to go cut my neighbor's grass. I need to do something good before I die. No opportunity to do anything good. No, no time to do anything like that. And he says, he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And he said to him, no way, it's too late. No, that's not what he said. Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, the only way to be forgiven is to throw yourself on the mercy of the one who can forgive you because forgiven people go to heaven. That's what all of us need. We don't need to be necessarily good or better or, what we, what, what, or, or, or even loved. We need forgiveness. That's what gets us into heaven. We have to be forgiven of our sin. And see, and here's the deal. I love it when people say to me that God is unfair. And I go, yes, he is. God is the most unfair of anybody else. You know why he's so unfair? Because what he should do is destroy us because we've mocked him. We've made fun of him. We've done listened to him. And he says, look, I created you. I made you when you were in your mother's womb. I've taken care of you. I've looked after you. I've provided for you. And we go, "Ah, I don't need you right now. He is so unfair toward us. He's biased toward us. Have you ever thought about that? That God loves you so much, he's biased towards you? I mean, He's so merciful. He chooses to show you mercy. He, listen, Christianity is the most just, fair system in an unjust, unfair world. So, yes, he is unfair. He loves you. The fair thing to do would to be to ignore you. But he loves you. And, and here's the thing. Here's, here's the thing. I, I, I love you. So, but, 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 but Arthur, come on. There's got to be another way. And he says, but look, this is so simple. Look, number one, everybody's welcome. It's not, I tell you what, you're not wearing red tennis shoes today, so you don't get to go. There's not a disclaimer there. Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's not only is everybody welcome, but everybody gets in the same way. It's not you get in one way, somebody gets in their way, I get in a different way. But no, everybody gets in the same way. Everybody. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Same way for everybody. And then lastly, everybody can meet the requirement. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loved, God gave, we believe, we receive. It's just that simple. God loved, God gave, we believe, we receive. See, see, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Forgiveness is found in placing our trust in the one who died on our behalf. And so today, I'm really glad that you're here. And if you're watching online, I'm really glad that you're still watching. Because right now, you can make that determination that you're going to step across the line of faith, put your trust in Jesus, and accept him as your Savior. You can do that here in the next couple minutes. And, and here's the thing. When I ask someone that question, most of the time they go, mm, you know, I, I, I'd like to, but I got to get a couple of things straightened out first. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying, I've got to get better first. I've got to do some good things first. I've been thinking about it, and I'm, but I'm, I'm, one of these days I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. I know I need to, but I got a couple of things that, you know, got, you're thinking, you got to get things right so God will love you. Do you hear yourself? You're just saying, if I could just be better, if I could be a better person, if I could do enough good things, then maybe, yeah. Do you hear yourself? Don't put it off. Because you're never going to be able to do enough good things. Don't wait. When I was in high school, I was a punk. Uh, I did a lot of things that I shouldn't have done. So every now and then, um, some people would put me and some of my other punk friends on a bus, and they would drive us, I lived about three and a half hours away from here, drive us down to Six Flags. And uh, we thought it was great. I have no idea why they thought bringing us to Six Flags was such a great idea, but that's what they did. And so we'd, they'd cut us loose, we'd get in the gate, and we'd go do whatever we wanted to. We just had to be back by 9 o'clock that night. <laughs> right. So 
the one times I'm coming down here. This is when I'm in high school. So and I'd been before, and so we're making, getting off the bus, and we're making a beeline. Me and a few of my buddies go ride the mind bender, and, which I think is hilarious because this is when I was in high school, and the, <laughs> the mind bender is still at Six Flags. <laughs> still an awesome ride, but you, I, I couldn't believe that it was still there. But anyway, so we're, so we're taking off. We're running all the way through the park, and we get up there and go through the line, and we get up there in that little house where you load up and get on the roller coaster, you know, and got those little lines, and, you know, you decide where you're going to get on. You want to ride in the front or the back or the, the middle, whatever. And so, you know, I decided I was going to ride in the front. Me and a buddy were riding in the front. Had a couple other friends that were going to move further in the back, and you know how that goes. You're sitting there going, looking down there, counting one, two, three. Hey, 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 move back. Because my other friends, they were pansies. I wanted to ride in the front, so they were all, you know, riding somewhere else. So anyway, my buddy and I were riding the front. And I mean, I get in uh, the front car, the roller coaster with my friend, and I am so geeked up about it. I mean, you know, the air brake releases, you know, and then you start rolling. I mean, as soon as I heard that sound, it was arms up, woo, ready to go, baby, right? And, and we're riding out of the little house. And then a chain catches arms up all the way, man among men. I ain't putting them down. I'm not a pansy. We're going to get after it because when you're 15 years old, this is all you got, right? That's how you prove your manhood. Can you keep your arms up on your riding roller coaster? And so we're getting up to, we're up top of that first hill. And so we're off the chain, but you know how it is. The back of the roller coaster is still hung onto the back of the chain a little bit. And when it releases, then we all go down the hill. So I'm looking over my shoulder, right? Because I want to see my friends and make sure they're man enough that they got their arms up and all this kind of stuff. So I look over my shoulder like this and look, and in the car in the seat right behind me, there's some boy crying. I mean, like the end of the world. He's not four years old. He's like 15. He's riding with his mama, <laughs> crying, sobbing, you know? And I'm just sitting there going, what? And so I was a punk. I didn't know Jesus. I had an extreme vocabulary, which I will not share with you this morning. But basically, I turned around to him and I said, shut up! <laughs> and his mother kind of like, you can't talk to him like that. And I'm like, you can't do anything. Get would be a horse collar around you right now. You can't do anything. <laughs> so she, I'm just, I'm saying things I had no business saying to him, right? So finally, you know, the end of the roller coaster comes, you know, releases off the chain. So we go, we go down that first hill, go through the loop, you know, and then we go around uh, and there's a loop there goes kind of around the outside, but back to the inside. We do that another, you know, loop like this. And then we come back, come back through the trees and we're coming back to the, to the, the house thing where you get off the rod, Right. And, and if you've ever, never been on that roller coaster, you know, at, at the end, there's this really, I just, I've never been on a roller coaster like this. It has such a really long path back to the uh, uh, track, back to the house where everything is, you know, you're going about 20, 25 miles an hour. It's just straight. It's smooth. Right? And so we're almost back. And then right behind me, I hear, Woo! <laughs> And I turned around, and that kid behind me had been crying. Got his hands up in the air. I said, shut up! Why do you wait to celebrate to get to the end of the ride, man? Enjoy the ride. Come on. So, Arthur, what's the point? Here's the point. Sometimes you look at life like it's a roller coaster, ups and downs, twists and turns. And so if life is a roller coaster... Don't wait to the end of your life to give your heart to Jesus. Don't wait. Don't be that person who's 147 years old rolling down the hall at the rest home going, woo, I just came to know Jesus. I love Jesus. Don't wait. Don't wait to the end. Don't put it off. No, today, today, it's not about what good needs to be done. It's about what Jesus has done for you. Today, give your heart to him. Don't put it off. Don't put it off another second.